as a board member of the Council for Canadian-American Relations, I want to introduce our friends that will be up here in conversation today. And the questions that will frame today's conversations are, where are we? What are our responsibilities? And where do we go from here? I'm super honored to introduce you to, and I'll go through each, Kaywin. Kaywin Feldman joins us in her role as director of the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Kaywin is also past president of the Association of Art Museum Directors, and I'm pretty sure Kaywin has to ask herself these three questions every day in her role in Washington. Uh, Sasha, Sasha Suda, joins us in her role as the George D. Widener Director and CEO at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Sasha received her PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts here in New York from NYU. Dr. Suda, in her previous role as the Director of Canada's National Gallery, truly represents CARS, cross-border goals of working together to identify our differences and identify our similarities. I'm very sure that Sasha, just like Kaywin, has to ask herself these three questions every day. Dawood Bey, Dawood is my dear friend and artist. Dawood joins us from Chicago. Dawood is a MacArthur Fellow and is currently a professor of photography and a former distinguished college artist at Columbia College, Chicago. Dawood, by exploring how we got here through retracing the footsteps of the Underground Railway through his photography and film can add a fourth question to the conversation, where have we been? Lisa Yagujanis is a Haida, Haida Gwai artist and master weaver, resides in British Columbia where I do. Lisa's practice honors our past through her protection of a traditional style of weaving known as Yelth Ku and Raven's Tail, one of the oldest forms of Haida textile creation hanging on to a heritage and tradition that was at risk of being erased through colonization. Like Dawood, Lisa's exploration of the past will add a great perspective while addressing where are we, what are our responsibilities, and where do we go from here. Darren, I don't know where Darren is yet, but my, uh, my dear friend Darren, Darren is president of the Ford Foundation a $16 billion international social justice philanthropy. Darren has been asking all of us these three questions as president of the Ford Foundation for a while now. Before joining Ford, Darren was president, was vice president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Previously, Darren was COO of Harlem's Abyssinian Development Corporation. Darren co-founded both the US Impact Investing Alliance and the President's Council on Disability Inclusion in Philanthropy. Darren is a recipient of 16 honorary degrees and will be honored tonight at CARS Gala. Darren has been included on numerous leadership lists, including Time Magazine's Most Influential and Out Magazine's Power 50. Darren sits on my imaginary advisory board I think we should all have an imaginary advisory board. Darren always reminds me to raise artists' voices, not my own. However, on a personal note, I am often asking myself and my imaginary board of trustees, is this social jewelry or is this social justice? And too often today, the answer is that it's just social jewelry. Well, today, Darren, Lisa, Dawood, Sasha, and Kaywin are going to get us to some social justice. And I want to invite Sasha and Kaywin up now to the stage to bring us all into a conversation that we can bring back to our families, our coworkers, our water cooler conversations, and keep ourselves and a, and a number of others a little less socially unconscious, or with a conscience. Welcome, hello. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Sasha and I, uh, as I, uh, we first explained when we were contacted, are extremely close friends. So we spent a lot of time just hanging out and talking together about all of these things that Bob mentioned. So you might just get a bit of Sasha and I hanging out uh, this morning. But I thought I would actually start because when we first started planning this session about almost a year ago, Sasha had a different job, and she uh, is now in Philadelphia 
uh, three weeks in um, with a little bit of a tumultuous arrival. How's it going, Sasha? Well, I did, um, first of all, I want to say hello to everybody. There are so many amazing friends and old friends, people I haven't seen, people I had meant to meet before leaving Ottawa. It's great to see everyone, including Angela Cassie, who's the interim director and CEO of the National Gallery of Canada, um, Kitty Scott, deputy director and chief curator, and just so many people who helped make the work happen that we'll be talking about today and reflecting on. I did uh, land in Philadelphia a month ago and had the great honor of becoming the George D. Widener director and CEO. And on my first day, had an extremely warm welcome with the beginning of a strike. <laughs> and so by I think day four, there was a three-story tall banner asking where I was which my children promptly realized was what they asked most evenings as well. <laughs> so we found some common ground and we, you know, we have an amazing board and an amazing management team and we got where we needed to go and have a really uh, an amazing next chapter ahead of us. So thrilled that everyone's under the roof, same roof now and um, kicked it off with an ice cream social and talking about the future. So we'll take a lot of what we talked about over the last few years and today into that conversation. Okay. Well, congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> Kaywin, by the way, said, we're going to put the moose on the table. Isn't that a Canadian saying? We'll talk about the strike right off the top. <laughs> so we have to do what? Is it a Canadian saying? I was always told it was. No, I'm getting lots of head shakes. OK, well, I, I learned something today. I sort of shook my head, too, I have to say. But, <laughs> but yeah, I think you know when we started, at the same, more or less the same time as the heads of national galleries, we talked a lot at the beginning about how they were different from, you know, a civic museum that serves an immediate community. And maybe you can teleport back to that time and what really s struck you in that first six months that you were in Washington. Yeah, so um, I actually vividly remember when I was um, considering the opportunity um, at the National Gallery, I was having uh, breakfast with one of my uh, mentors, and I said to him, you know, I'm struggling because I had, uh, at that stage, been a director for 30 years. I'd run three museums in smaller communities across the United States, and I said, I've always been part of a community institution. And what feeds my soul is watching the community come in and, um, and really own the art museum as, as their place. And I said, in the National Gallery, you know, while of course it has a local community, its foremost mission is not necessarily community engagement. So I'm sort of struggling with that. And I'll never forget, he leaned across the table and his eyes got big and he said, yes, but the nation becomes your community. And what does that mean? And I love a challenge, so already, you know, I immediately sort of got excited. And, um, and it's been really um, exciting and interesting, particularly at this time where um, we've had such a volatile, I've been there for three and a half years, and so it's been a three and a half years of incredible uh, challenge and volatility. And um, you know, thinking about what does it mean to be the nation's art museum, and how do we demonstrate that, how do we, um, exemplify how do we serve the nation, but also recognizing that we do also have a local community. And uh, that came home to me um, early on in my tenure when it looked like the Nationals were going to win the World Series. And um, I emailed my team and I said, okay, I think the Nats are going to win. What are we going to do? And I always know when I have a bad idea because I sent out a message and silence ensues. So. About two days later, somebody emails me and says, oh, we don't do that here. We don't engage in popular culture. And besides, we're the National Museum, so it would be wrong for us to support one team over another. And I said, but it's the Nats, and it's a hometown team, and it's been like 30 years since they won the World Series. And so we, um, we put up a banner, and we, we did uh, engage. And so um, I like to phrase it that I think we have a healthy tension between being national and being local. And I think that's a, a right place to be. Um, I think you um, also navigated that really well in Canada. Well, I think Ottawa is such a unique place geographically. It's, it's pretty far out there. And for example, as a 
kid whose parents were immigrants, that wasn't a place we pilgrimaged to. And we have a lot of people in the audience from Calgary today. I don't know how many of the Canadians in the crowd did an annual trip to Ottawa. So tourism um, was always something we drew on, but it didn't, even you know, local tourism wasn't what got us through the day, through the fiscal year. Um, and it was our local community that really drove GATE. And I think that, in a way, we were serving, over-serving that community and underserving that national community and started to talk about, okay, what does it mean to drive a national conversation about art? Forget about this place within these four walls. And one thing I want to kind of just point out, which is also truly unique and a luxury in some ways, is how different our budgets function than they do at the typical civic art museum. I think when I was exploring taking this job, lots of people said, look, it's government funded. It's not so dynamic. It's going to be hard to get things done. Um, is, do you really want to do that, be part of a bureaucracy? And then COVID hit, and suddenly it looked pretty darn sexy to have that stability. And we talked a lot about how um, it was almost painful at times to have that financial stability in a, need, in a moment of such volatility and need for um, the work that we were doing and maybe not necessarily that having that ability to pivot right away. And so I think there's that tension too, right, of having, um, having these resources in public trust, both the collection but the operating budgets that are driven in, our, I think, both of our cases by um, tax dollars and just wanting to serve and also living within a very different reality that doesn't allow you to move quite as quickly. Uh, but I think you've done a pretty good job moving pretty quickly. Um, early in our days, we made, I think, a really smart move, and I think I have to credit you with it being your idea of getting another director from a national museum to join us in trying to move along as a group. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, throughout my career, I really believe in um, the uh, relationships and relationships across borders across um, institutions, and, um, and not exclusively Sasha and I. And so we started something called In Search of Belonging, and, um, and it was the National Gallery of Canada, the National Gallery in Washington, and the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne, Australia, um, which did complicate it because it, <laughs> phone calls had to be at, or Zooms at you know, nine o'clock at night uh, across all of the time zones. Uh, but we used it as a way to um, bring staff members together from different parts of the building and discuss the things that they were working on and grappling with. And, um, and for example, um, uh, the National Gallery um, had so much and still has so much to learn from our partners in Canada and Australia in dealing with and um, collecting and showing um, uh, works by Indigenous artists. And um, the National Gallery in Washington um, did, does not, did not in the past collect work by Native American artists. It was a decision that we defined um, American artists as artists working in the European tradition. And, uh, and a lot of our um, decisions were that the Smithsonian has the National Museum of the American Indian right across from us on the mall, so um, there was, the work was already being represented. And uh, I didn't agree with that. I feel like if we are the nation's collection of um, art of the United States, we should have a collection of art by uh, Native American artists. And so we have just started collecting in that area. And we are so far behind our colleagues in um, Canada and Australia. And um, we've, we've learned a lot from, particularly from the work that you did there with the team, Sasha, um, in um, expanding the role, in working with the community, uh, working with uh, First Nations artists. Yeah, it was uh, definitely a strength that ex has existed at the National Gallery of Canada for decades. You know, the surprisingly, the first acquisition of an Indigenous artist was in 1986, a painting by Carl Beam. But when I joined, uh, there was a team of incredible Indigenous curators and programmers 
who wanted to do much more and had recently expanded their collecting purview to include historical indigenous art, which is, you know, has, it's very, you know, it's easy to problematize and it creates a lot of challenges to work through um, in all ways, um, including legally and kind of philosophically. But one amazing idea that, that I was just there to help launch, which had been in gestation for years, was this recreation project, which is to remake traditional indigenous objects. And you'll hear from Lisa Hegman Yaguyanis a little bit later. Um, and actually, actually think about a non-Western way of conceiving art, which is that it, this idea of an original work isn't core. It's about continuity of practice. And it's really just a very different worldview. So I'm excited because, of course, Tony's team from Victoria has been working in that realm for quite some time, working directly with community and artists. Um, thinking of sovereignty uh, as a part of that culture of the museum working out there. And I would say that we really um, started to move closely towards, towards a new worldview. But as you said, I mean, we are founded in the Western, not just worldview, but tradition and physically, even just the way our buildings are organized. So, you know, and that's something we still love is are those origins. You know, that's where our own academic background lies. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that. You know, what's that tension there? Yeah. Uh, I, one of the many reasons I love what I do is because I enjoy uh, learning in new areas. And uh, my first degree was in Greek and Roman art and architecture. And then I studied Dutch 17th century painting. And so I always say old masters are home for me. But I love being able to do it all. And uh, when I was in Minneapolis, um, the museum has an extraordinary Asian collection, and I had never worked with Asian art before. And um, learning about particularly Japanese art was one of my great life joys. And so um, I love being able to be in charge um, of the responsibility of a historic collection. We have works from the 13th century to um, present day at the National Gallery. And, um, and I think it's really exciting. And I, I, I don't know, Sasha, about your experience, but I, I think our um, curators of old master uh, works of art at, um, in many American museums are so afraid that the public isn't interested in their collections anymore, that the public doesn't want to see old masters, that contemporary art is in and that institutional resources go towards contemporary art. We keep building new facilities focused on contemporary art. And um, they're, they're very concerned. And I actually find this moment really exciting because I believe profoundly in the importance of historic collections. And I believe the works have relevance today. And, um, and that it's actually on us to communicate that relevance, to be able to inspire and encourage and make connections across the institution. And so rather than seeing it as a frightening moment of challenge, I really see it as an, an exciting moment uh, to, to be able to communicate the you know, passion that we both feel in the work um, by old master artists. Um, you know, it is a challenge when uh, our collections are analyzed. The National Gallery collection, for example, is uh, taken as a whole, it's 90% works by white male artists. And that's the historic collection we have. We're certainly collecting more broadly today, but um, we can't change 80 years of history and we still believe in that collection that we have. So it's, uh, I think, a really interesting time of bringing forward the relevance. For sure, and I should point out, we have this sort of shared DNA, the two institutions. So the National Gallery of Canada in the 50s was buying from the same private collection that the National Gallery in Washington was, just to all of my Canadian friends in the audience. We passed, as Canadians, on the only da Vinci in North America. And so then uh, they got on a plane, flew down to Washington, and it took all of probably 10 minutes for them to write the check. 
So it still stings a little bit every time I, I'm in Washington and I see that and I know that history. And I think it's, I mean, it's extremely exciting art. And I do think there's this fear that something we don't want to know about it will come out if we dig a little bit deeper. And, you know, not as a critique, but an observation in Ottawa, the European galleries, which are beautiful, and I would say they're cu a curator's galleries. I mean, chronological, I might say a little bit overhung. It's all there. You can take it all in. And it's been the same installation for the entire life of that building, so over 30 years. And everything has shape-shifted around it. And one of the exciting ideas, actually, that Kitty had when I was there was to actually say, why do we keep talking about how European art it impacts all the other arts and non-Western arts? Why, why don't we talk about the return gaze? What does it look like to reinstall this whole institution and pull this narrative all the way through? And of course, it's such a logical idea, and there are just so many reasons why that's hard to do in our institutions. But we have to keep pushing so that we can. Yeah. Um, but without, without those collections, and without honoring those collections and engaging in those tough conversations, you know, we, we, don't, we lose that history. And it makes us more interesting, I think. Yeah, I actually had this sort of aha moment recently is we're think we were also thinking about reinstalling um, our uh, collection and thinking differently about the collection. And um, I, I sort of drew on my pad this uh, picture of a, like a, a chest of drawers. And I think historically the National Gallery, like many museums and even um, how we've seen art history, we think about it as drawers. And so one drawer is the Dutch school, one drawer is the Italian school, one drawer is the French school, another drawer is photographs, another drawer is works on paper, that we see these very um, confined singular units that stand apart, and our galleries are installed that way today. But I think that in our global, connected, complicated world today, I would move from the analogy of a chest of drawers to a constellation, and because it's a constellation of relationships. So for example, we could think about you know, Paris in the early 20th century, and you certainly have uh, French artists. You also have Latin American artists who were in Paris at the time, again, exchanging. So they were learning from each other. You had... Um, exchanges of um, you know, artists from Russia coming in, that, that we could think more about the constellation of uh, stories than those separate drawers uh, in, in thinking about our history. I like that. Um, speaking of drawers, like most museums, we had storage problems <laughs> there. And we're thinking about how do we, as a national institution, which is sort of totally singular in the fact that it receives an appropriation from the government to build co a collection and, you know, as defined, a national collection. And how do we, you know, continue buying in a way that really at least aims to serve the whole nation and beyond, all of Turtle Island. And so we really did something exciting, which is not my news to share, but, uh, there's a series of acquisitions that are now rolling out, which are um, partnerships with institutions across the country. Uh, we just launched a weather station on Fogo Island and really helping to bring the national collection elsewhere um, first so that people have something art related, an amazing work of art in their community that makes them kind of see beyond what um, day-to-day -day life could be like. So that's how we're avoiding having drawers. See, that was a really awkward segue, but I'm getting <laughs> through our punch list. Uh, okay. Um, I think that uh, it is, we uh, at the National Gallery have been thinking a lot about uh, how we do serve the nation beyond the you know four or five million people who come through our doors. It's a very important audience and we remain focused, but that's just four or five million out of the 
300 million plus uh, people that we, we could be serving, the taxpayers who, who pay for the, the National Gallery. So um, I, I love your idea of the shared collections. Um, we don't receive any public funding for the purchase of art, so that is all done with private funds. But uh, we are thinking a lot about partnerships across the United States and how to get our collection out even more broadly, how to um, share expertise, again, with the idea that we have as much to learn as we have to gain in partnerships and sharing expertise. And then we all learned, of course, af uh, during COVID about the power of the internet and that our websites were really, we were operating lemonade stands with our websites. And I think we're all, all museums are really thinking about how we can do a better job of engaging beyond our walls uh, with our uh, digital work. And I, I don't know what, uh, what you were doing in Canada that way. I like the idea of the lemonade stand, because it's sweet still, but maybe with a little bit of a limited audience of who's already walking by. Um, is that what you meant? Uh, yes. OK. Yeah. Well, we, you know, we really switched quickly, but I think it was where we were a little clunkier, because we just hadn't made those investments quite practically and really rethought what it means to be digital. And I have to be honest, I'm not quite sure I know yet. Um, like all museums, including Philadelphia, and I'm maybe you guys are unique in that I think most of your collection is digitized. I think we really struggle to digitize. So when COVID hit and you only have about 2% of the collection online, it just felt like well, if that's where you have to start, there's just we may not as well we may not as may as well not get out of bed this morning. But you know, the team really jumped up and did Instagram lives, all of that kind of stuff. And I'm excited to see where it goes from there because I think the idea to serve the whole country is what we're thinking of. But I I still happen to believe that we the idea that's gonna make sense is something I we're not even thinking about yet. Uh, I just, I don't know if we're thinking in the right way since we haven't found traction. And I'm not sure yet that we all agree on who our digital audience is. But uh, I think it's an exciting place to think. Um, and I'm excited to see who takes the big step forward. Yeah, I agree, because I don't think it's happened yet in our yeah. field. Yeah, we're still moving around the edges. Sasha, let's go to the title of our discussion today, Art with a Conscience. And yeah. let's talk about your conscience. Uh, so how do you think about art with a conscience? That's a, it's a big question. And I think we've felt a little bit ambivalent about it, right? And, and I think, Bob, you nailed it when you said, is it social decoration or is it jewelry? Jewelry. Ju jewelry. It's even better because it feels good. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the idea is that for me, that every day you get up and you're part of an evolution, you know, that these institutions stay relevant and that they serve the communities, you know, I think we all agree they exist for, but that we're not always entirely specific about what those communities are and why. Um, I think that it's about telling stories and looking around the table and asking yourself who's not at the table and really focusing on making sure that that lived experience is represented in some way, not just at the table, but on the walls, in the space. And I think it's about pushing the edges of what makes us feel good. And I'm guessing that was true 30 years ago as well. I don't think it's new. We maybe have a slightly different orientation or compass now, um, but I also think that when, you, when I think about the people who really inspired me as museum directors and artists, they were never too comfortable in, in where they were headed. And I think, yes, it's about people getting people in the doors who don't feel comfortable there, for sure. But we've been doing that work for 30 years, and we still have that problem, which is probably a good thing. We're expanding that reach. But I think more than ever, it's about bringing in artists and stories that have continued to be left out and um, asking ourselves why that is and looking at our structures and really thinking hard about what's missing. How about you? 
I guess I think about it a little bit differently in that I think what is is has changed in the last maybe decade is I do believe that like corporations, museums are now more explicit about their values and that we use our values to make decisions. You and I did it together on a couple of tough issues we had early on in our tenures. And um, as, uh, my, as I was considering going to the gallery, one of the gallery's uh, key stakeholders um, explicitly said, I'm very worried about Kaywin becoming the director because she's um, too committed to values. And I thought, well, you know, shouldn't we be? And, um, but you know, there, there was an era where, you know, museums were seen as this sort of completely neutral space. We were just four walls to hang works of art that people could come in and see. And I think in our, it, it is because our world has just become so volatile and complex. And just in the last two and a half years, the number of difficult issues that have been thrown at all of us, at all of us in this room, um, and then particularly as you're leading an institution, I have found that the often the only way to do it is to just look at your North Star, look at, the, look at your values. And of course, they're not just my values. We, uh, shortly after I arrived at the gallery, we did a lot of work as an, for the entire staff in really setting out a list of our values, which included you know, things like excellence, integrity, of course, really you know, needs to be there. Uh, as we polled the staff, we had a huge participation with the staff. Something like 80% of the staff um, wrote in uh, and diversity, equity, inclusion, and access were the number one value that the National Gallery of Arts staff articulated uh, for us. Uh, fostering a curiosity and encouraging learning is key. And, um, and so having those values, I find, is really the only way to navigate during this difficult time as uh, things are coming at us um, more and more quickly. I agree. I think the values piece is probably one of the, also the biggest management challenges. You know, I think having a really clear set of values and living to them makes it easier to be in a leadership role. But I also think we're living in a moment, having come out of a strike, for example, where people are really watching that you live your values on a kind of on a micro level. And it's, it's hard to walk that line sometimes because, well, in any leadership role, because decisions aren't always so black and white in terms of you know, what's right and what's wrong. And often we don't get the good decisions, right? It's the worse and w more worse. Yeah. Um, but I also think on a micro level, that's how we're being judged as institutions from the outside as well. And what I'm trying to understand now is how true is that? You know, how, I think it's very true, but I also think there are people that don't believe it at this moment. So how do we get to the point where we can really hear from the world outside of the four walls of the institution so that they can help us on that journey? And that's, to live into it, you know? How can they expect more from us so that it's clear where we need to go? When you say don't believe it, what's the it? Well, some, some folks maybe think this isn't the work that art museums should be yeah. doing right now. And I think that I have, I have obviously strong feelings that we should be doing that work and sometimes it can be quietly. You may not know it's happening, but you've suddenly entered a world that you never knew you could intersect with. But I also think that there is some complacency in getting there. Um, and, and it can be hard at times. You referenced a couple of decisions we made. I mean, there are some rough patches where you, you ask yourself, did, that, did we really need to, to do that? And um, we won't know for a long time, I think, whether it advanced us or was just rough water. Mm -hmm. But I think you've done a great job of signaling to the, I mean, Canada is a, is a relative big country, small population, smaller market. You've signaled, you know, you had a big job of signaling to that, the whole 
art world in the US what you were about. And I thought your rebranding was a really clever way of doing that. Tell us about that and that process and what you learned and what you've heard from people. Yeah, and actually I think, um, uh, you know, the National Gallery of Canada, the National Gallery of Washington actually <laughs> rebranded about the exact same time. So, um, and, and in both ways, I think, really represented where our institutions, you know, were. And f uh, for us at the National Gallery, it was in part because uh, the National Gallery had never done a brand. There was this feeling that we were, uh, that that was too commercial and we were sort of separate from that. And uh, shortly after I arrived, I walked our um, whole campus, you know, a million square feet, and I found that we had written our name 36 different ways. And we called ourselves the National Gallery, the National Gallery of Art, the Gallery, NGA. We had a different font for every one of them. It was hard to know it was the same institution and an institution that was really proud. And so uh, we, we did this uh, rebranding. And uh, what was key to it was in uh, the, the new visual look of a brand, because that's only part of a brand, we bolded national, and several people have said to me, you know, why didn't you bold art? You're about art. But I feel really strongly that the taxpayers pay all of the expenses of the National Gallery. Our, serve, our, our focus, our mission is to serve this great nation. And of course, we do it by welcoming people from all over the world. It doesn't mean we only serve Americans, but our welcoming is part of our service to the United States. And uh, I'm really proud of it and uh, grateful for it and humble, um, humbled by it. So that was our process. And, and I think your brand also reflected your values and where uh, the National Gallery of Canada is. Big time. I, you know, it's sort of a, it's brand, strategy, strategic plans. They all sound kind of boring, but they were so key to us in that moment because they were a way of communicating to the community beyond Ottawa, what we wanted to be. And, you know, Angela, who's now interim director and CEO, was the head of strategy and inclusion. And it was so critical to us that strategy and inclusion, we've never done a strategic plan before in the history of the institution. That, you know, the JEDI work, justice, equity, device, diversity, and inclusion <laughs> work um, be, you know, synonymous with strategy. And it was really also a way to respond to our team's desire for us to really be more engaged in, in all of those pieces of work. And that rolled into brand. So we took all these, you know, it was months of really tough work, talking to each other, figuring out who we wanted to be, and taking that kind of data and qualitative data into a branding process, which, you know, took all of that those aspirations, collective aspirations, and put it out to the world, partly to kind of encourage people to expect something from us that they could either push back on or really cheer us on as we move forward. And I would say that that brand was really important because even as we were moving more slowly with some of the pieces of work, we, we had opened a channel for people to tell us why we weren't living into it or why we were doing a great job or why we were totally off base. And having that feedback from the outside world also was really important to the staff inside, who, you know, I think um, more and more it's, you know, there's, there's just, can you can get inside yourself in these big institutions and forget that you're, yes, there are difficult things happening inside the institution, but there's this whole world out there that we're meant to serve, and that can be really inspiring to us and maybe even help us get over some of those internal pieces. Well, I'm not sure if someone's keeping time, but I think we are at time. So um, I think we will move on to the second portion of today, which is to invite our panelists up to join us.